Thank you for the introduction. Um, I would like to start with an example you can probably relate to. So imagine you need to plug in an HDMI cable at the back of the TV. So if the TV is very close to the wall, then you might have trouble seeing the plug. And if you have troubles with that, you, you might first feel out where the plug is with the fingers. Then you're going to have to figure out if this is the right plug and so on. So manipulating objects that are out of sight is really difficult. Now, if you can reposition the TV or if you can reposition your body in such a way to get a glance at the TV, uh, at the plug, that will make your task much easier. But if you're doing a maintenance in an engine compartment of a ship, there you cannot just reposition the engine. Uh, so, but there you could maybe use tools, tools as mirrors or endoscopic inspection cameras or what we imagine in near future, you'll be able to use remote cameras in combination with augmented reality headsets. And if we stay with this HDMI example, then, then you might be able to see through the occluder uh, in, into the ports so you'll see the the plugs and you'll see the cable or the HDMI stick that you need to plug into one of the ports. Now, this is only one way to visualize the occluded area. This is only one way to augment the user's view. And there are many other ways you could augment the user's view. So you could use virtual mirrors that can be repositioned and render the remote imagery or you could use, uh, you could render wireframes and other cues for better depth judgment, or you could simply render the remote imagery as a picture-in-picture -picture view of which follows the user's gaze or is anchored somewhere in the world space. Now, these examples and these previous works don't really, don't really concern themselves with uh, manual interaction. They're more about inspecting. And what we were interested in was which augmented views would best support manual interaction with occluded objects. And to, do, to figure out this, like uh, we had some questions that we wanted to answer, so questions like, is aligning the remote imagery with the object's physical location important? Um, do augmented views that are really difficult to implement, uh, are they so much better than the ones that are very easy? So is like remote camera screen just as good as the seat review? And we are wondering also how do body mounted or tool mounted remote cameras perform? And to, to answer these questions, we, we did an evaluation of four augmented views. And so I'll go through these one by one, but first uh, I would like to tell you about our setup. So we had a, we had a one by one meter box uh, which front face act as a, acted as an occluder. And on the other side of this occluder, there was a physical object that the participants interacted with. Um, during the task, users were supported with one of the four augmented views. And these views were rendered by HoloLens and they were implemented with virtual cameras and with virtual models of these physical objects. So the first view that we had was, um, was static camera view. So this is one of the simplest approaches to visualizing the occluded area. So it simulates a static remote camera on the other side of the occluder. Um, and the image that it captures is rendered as a picture-in-picture -picture view that just follows users' uh, head movement. So similar as the windows in the HoloLens's operating system. The other view that we had is dynamic camera view. So this one simulates uh, either a tool-mounted or a finger-mounted camera. So in this case, in the video, you see a camera mounted on the HDMI stick. So, and again, the two-dimensional uh, uh, imagery that was captured was rendered as a picture-in-picture -picture view that follows user's head movement. So, the third view we had is the seat review. Here we render the three-dimensional uh, models of the objects at the exact location of the physical objects. 
So at the exact location of their physical counterparts, so it's kind of like an X-ray vision. And then we had a clone 3D view where we rendered these three-dimensional mo models of the objects, of the occluded objects at the displaced location. So the location was displaced more than half a meter away on the left, and it was also rotated, uh, the objects were rotated so they faced the participants. So to evaluate these four views, we, we had five tasks. And since there's no taxonomies of uh, occluded interaction, we, we structured the task space on our own. So we looked at the taxonomies of grasping and taxonomies of manual tasks. And these are some of the works we used. And the task categories were selected in such a way to cover as many variations of movement constraints while at the same time uh, reflect familiar daily life tasks that participants would be familiar with. Uh, so the tasks were pressing, so finding a target and changing the state of one of the switches, rotating, so rotating a dial to a specific state, dragging a slider to a specific state, uh, then plugging an HDMI stick into one of the plugs, and placing an item on one of the hooks. Uh, with these five tasks, uh, we evaluated the views, so Particip uh, we, did a, we ran a within-subject study, we recruited 24 participants, and each of them went through each of the tasks. We counterbalanced the task order, and in each of the tasks, participants uh, used all of the views. Uh, we added a control condition, so a fifth view, in which participants uh, did not get help from, uh, from the augmented reality headset. And uh, order of the views was also randomized. So we measured performance and user satisfaction. From, from performance metrics, we measured task duration, uh, uh, time to start of manipulation, and error rates. And to measure user satisfaction, we had participant, uh, participants rate the views at the end of each task, and we also had them answer uh, we had them answer open-ended questions about their preferences of the views. And now I'll pick some of the results and tell you about some of the performance results, uh, the overall rating of the views, and some points from the thematic analysis that we did on the open-ended uh, questions. So here you can see the, the analysis of task duration. So as the task duration varied quite a bit, we normalized the times, and on, on the plot you see that the dashed line marks the average ta task duration, while the plotted points show the time delta to the average, average task duration. So like in simple language, like you can see that having no visual help uh, made participants slower, so they were about half, they took about half a second longer to complete the task than the average saturation. And this is not surprising, having no visual help should make you slower than having some visual guidance. But surprisingly, the dynamic camera view also was even worse that, than having no visual help. Uh, so not only the view did not help, it actually impeded performance. They were two seconds slower that, than with no visual help. Um, this was not the case for the static camera view. So that one performed better than no visualization. And as expected, see-through view performed uh, well, and it was about one and a half second faster than no visualization, while surprisingly, Clone 3D view also performed really well, like on pair with seat review. Mm, this was surprising as, as previous work on perceptual adaptation suggests that displaced views uh, should impede some performance. And if you look at user satisfaction, um, we see similar patterns. So this figure shows overall rating of the views. Uh, the, the participants were asked to rate the views on a seven-point Likert scale after completing all the tasks. And uh, the dark red color shows strong disagreement and the dark blue agreement. The neutral preference for the view is colored as white. 
And the width of the box shows the number of participants that answered with a specific rating. So, for example, if you looked at the Clone 3D view, you're going to see that there were seven participants that rated it with the highest rating. And in general, the Clone 3D view was ranked very highly as did the seat review. Um, the worst ranked views were having no help, no visualization, and the dynamic camera view. So to understand these results and the previous results, we also did a thematic analysis, and here are some points from it. So the participants perceive the dynamic camera view as hard to manipulate, confusing, as, and as having an unstable view. And some participants had some positive remarks about it. They said that it felt game-like. Then the static camera view was perceived as, having, as providing a good overview, but it felt too far away. Now, this is understandable because a static camera view cannot both provide a good overview and a good close-up. And the seat review were perceived as natural, intuitive, real, and easy to manipulate. Now, in light of these results, I would like to discuss some implications. So, what are the learnings that we can take to design future systems for occluded interaction and, and also visualizations for occluded interaction? So, being able to adjust the point of view is, is important because it allows users to see relevant parts of the occluded interaction space. So for example, if they, they can switch between good overview, a good close-up, or they can see the objects under a specific angle. Now, how exactly the point of view can be adjusted is also very important. It's, it's likely that the clone 3D view and the seat review were ranked so highly because, because users could just change the point of view as they would do it in real, in real life. So if, if they wanted to see something up close, they could just move closer. If they wanted to see it under a different angle, they could just move. And this was not the case with the hand-mounted cam hand cameras, with the dynamic cameras, as the mapping between the point of view changes and the participant movement was, did not feel intuitive. And this also brings us to the second, second factor that made the dynamic camera condition perform really bad. So, the view stability. Participants found the remote imagery uh, from dynamic camera confusing as the view changed too quickly. And an unstable view is not just unhelpful, but it, an, it can actually impede the performance. So it can override the reliance on proprioception, past knowledge of objects, and the tactile feedback you get from from interacting with the occluded objects. And the last implication I would like to discuss is the alignment between the vis visualization of occluded objects and their actual physical location. So in the seat review, the, the virtual models were perfectly aligned with the occluded object. So in, in other words, they were rendered at the exact location of where the physical objects were. And this kept the spatial relation between the visual feedback, uh, the user's hand, and the, the head movement. And we assume that this is really important for good performance and also for good user satisfaction. But as we see in the clone 3 review, this is not necessarily so. So there, the virtual models were not aligned with the physical objects. They were actually quite severely displaced, and they were also rotated. And we assume this will impede performance, but it did not. So Clone 3D View performed on pair with Seat Review, and it was rated even higher in user satisfaction. So this is interesting because it makes us wonder what, like, how far can we push this displacement? And also, can we do some other transformations? Can we scale them? Can we do some kind of nonlinear transformations and still like, have, have it work well for occluded interaction or even better? Um, and another good thing about displaced views performing well is that they are more easy to implement than systems, like, than, than, for example, a seat review in a system. So imagine putting a depth camera on the other side of the occluder. Um, by streaming the point cloud, you can easily render a three-dimensional uh, 
some kind of clone 3D view in the user's headset. But if you want to do a C3 view, it's not going to work well because with the depth camera, you're going to get just the outer surface of occluded objects. And that might look weird when you render only the outer surface from the, uh, from the point of view of the, uh, of the user. And yeah, with, with this, I would like to conclude and restate some of the findings. So we showed that the C3 view is good at supporting occluded interaction. We questioned the usefulness of hand-mounted cameras uh, for occluded interaction. And we showed that displaced 3 review performed well and is the preferred choice for occluded interaction in our study. And yeah, the later finding also opens up interesting future explorations. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Clement. So the way this works in this room is we have a number of stations with microphones. One is here. There's number two over there. Four and three. So if you can make it to a microphone, that would be great. And then you could also raise your hand because we also have student volunteers distributed in the room, and they will try to find you. And then you have to figure out among yourselves who was first. Uh, hello, thank you for your talk. Uh, Jens Grubert, Coburg University of Applied Sciences. Um, I um, yeah, uh, was astounded by your findings that this clone 3D view and the see-through mode, they uh, worked on par. Do, can you speculate a little bit about if and how this could transfer to either more complex spatial manipulations or to procedural tasks because the, the things that you did were like more uh, atomic uh, yeah, manipulations, uh, and can you speculate a little bit more about how this could transfer to more complex tasks, so where you have to do things in a procedure one after one? Um, can you speculate about that? Uh, yeah, so the more complex tasks that we had here were, were not super complex, but still, like, it was placing an item onto one of the hooks or uh, placing the HDMI into one of the plugs. And there are... I would speculate that it could it could apply easily to a more or to more complex tasks as well because once the participants were probably interested mostly in the relative position between the where the HDMI is and where the, the the plugs are so even if they would have to plug it in the first plug and then take it out and then the next one they would still have I think the this visual feedback hand eye coordination so it could work in in more complex procedural tasks, I would think. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you for your great, great presentation. I want to ask you that uh, uh, the, the model skill is, uh, should be tested by the training, uh, should be examined the training effects. So the, for the, uh, such kind of condition would be more facilitated uh, learning. So, because uh, uh, it, I think that it's uh, really first time to the participant to the uh, using this condition, so the, you, the, through the training, the what kind of the condition would be chosen the time of the, this kind of task? Yeah, I, I agree. Training effect is very important here. Um, this is also why we picked some familiar tasks, so at least the participants would be used to familiar tasks. Um, but what's surprising here, we had very little amount of training before starting the experiment and the first trials were always the, the training, but the clone tree view, the displays view, without training still performed really well. So it suggests that even the, it could be performed even better with, with training or some more extreme alternations or transformations could work with training. Yeah. Let's give Clemens again, Clement again a round of applause.